Well, we are spreading the news about some First Class Arts newsletters. This month you'll find out what's jumping off the page and what's hopping in the world of jingles. Only on the February edition of Artifacts, bounding your way next. Hello everyone and welcome to Artifacts, the show that brings the arts in Minneapolis home to you. I'm Janet Zahn with the Office of Film, Video and Recording. And I'm Phil Lindsay with the Minneapolis Community Development Agency. And during this month of February, the middle of winter in Minnesota, we hope that this show will be like a ray of sunshine or <laughs> maybe one of those lamps that simulate sunshine in your life. Phil, have you ever tried one of those lamps or maybe gone to a tanning booth? No, I just sit under a low watt bulb <laughs> all winter long. <laughs> That's kind of what I do too. Yeah. Moving on to our guest lineup. First off, we have Johnny Hagen, composer, arranger, and owner of Absolute Music, a company that creates original music and sound design for commercials and features in his oh so fun full service studio in downtown Minneapolis. Sounds like fun. Then you'll meet Mary Smith. She's the editor of the Minnesota Literature Newsletter, a gem of a publication that offers readers the latest news, opportunities, and events in the literary firmament. Two other newsletter editors, John Scallon of Mac. Facts. MACT is the Minnesota Association of Community Theaters, and Nancy Mason Hauser from the Minnesota Dance Newsletter will be here to give you the inside scoop on why and how they do what they do. Now we also have video of a poetry reading by Mark Christensen that's at the uh, Celebration of Minnesota Writers 5 a while back, reading from his book, Faith in Ice Time. And we have a sneak preview of the Minnesota Scholastic Arts Awards running February 6th through the 17th at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And an update from one of our artifacts favorite it's Merle Lopnow. Watch this. It has become the, the, especially the professional theater has become over what I would call overproduced. There's too much scenery, too much technical side. They're trying to compete with the cinema and uh, television and all that, and they, they, they can't do it on a stage. I mean, they, mm -hmm. uh, there's a from Shakespeare, the play is the thing. Play is the thing, right. And uh, so uh, I, I object to, uh, well, as I mentioned the other day, uh, when somebody mentions Phantom of the Opera, I don't think about the, the play. I think about the falling chandelier and the grand drape when that felt was spectacular, mm -hmm. but it didn't add anything so far as the play was concerned. That's right. So you're looking more for the writing. The, the right. directing and the acting, right. and less of the, mm -hmm. of the ambience of it all. And we're back, and I'm Janet Zahn, and with me today is Johnny Hagen, Absolute Music. Hi. Welcome. Glad you could come. Thanks. I'm so excited to talk with you because I just think your business is so interesting. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about <laughs> Absolute Music, what it is, what you do. It's, we, do we do original music for commercials. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, it, it's a business where people bring you uh, they send you storyboards and say we want to do something, put some music or put a soundtrack behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's a full recording studio and mm -hmm. I put, I create with other people original music mm -hmm. that makes the spot more bright and bouncy. Sing. Sing. Yeah. It makes it fun. Yeah. Uh, I make the, uh, uh, we do a lot of just soundtracks alone. There's no music. It's mm -hmm. uh, sound design is the funny word that people call it it's, nowadays. But that's, it's, yeah. it's kind of a funky word. But. Do people call it, do they say jingle anymore? Do they say the word jingle? <laughs> it's so rare. They People do. It's yeah. more like a cute word for the public. It's yeah. not a, <laughs> we barely do jingles. Even. Who yeah. does jingles? It'd be great to do a jingle, actually. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be fun to actually have singers come in. Mm -hmm. um, you just more of it's just music. It's more mm -hmm. music behind things nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a, it's a trend the way things have happened and bring back singers. Bring us back the coke. You know we like to make the world the sing stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, before we get too much more into the detail of what you're doing now, I do want to take just a step back sure. in time. You're a musician. You've been a musician for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and you have a. a a, a band passed. A band passed. Yes. You know, don't remind me. Let's talk about it. I want to. You got some photos well, here. I do. Let's show them. I just them. happen to have some examples right well, here, Janet. <laughs> Why? Uh, look at that. Well, look at this. this are, these are some. Uh, there's some celebrities you might recognize yes. in here. Mm -hmm. There's some. Uh, uh, this is a band we had in Duluth mm -hmm. um, back in. I think it was like 1977. Mm -hmm. About in there, it was called the Blind Texas Salamanders. We played a lot of local houses. Now, uh -huh. Rick Shepchick, he's a local, is that? He's the, on the court. Rick? Yep, yep, Rick there. Rick played in, uh, Rick played guitar. He was one of the writers of the, in the group. Mm -hmm. He, uh, 
a lot of a lot of these folks are Duluth guys mainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kent Bovee playing bass in the center, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm over here hidden in the corner. Oh, there you are. Yep. Eugene Huddleston's over there in front of me. Sure. Locally, sure. he's a great jazz pianist here in town. Cool. And um, is that just the four of us? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, That's good, Duluth. a good group. Good mm -hmm. fun group. Mm -hmm. There's another one. Uh, oh, look at this. This was. Uh, oh, this is Le Rue. I worked yeah. with Gary Rue, which is. Uh, this gentleman right here, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Gary and I still work together a lot on yep. uh, co-writing things for mm -hmm. commercials. Mm -hmm. um, Who else is in there? Leslie Ball. Mm -hmm. She's got Singing. Ball's Theater, Ball's sure. Theater here in town. Yeah. Leslie's, yeah. She's quite fun. Mm -hmm. Lovely uh, wardrobe. Lovely wardrobe. Yeah, gotta yeah. have it. Oh, yeah. What year was that? This is 19... Uh, 80, 80, in 1980, 1980. Sorry to test your memory. <laughs> yeah, it's like, God, I can't remember this stuff. But it was, right. this was a great, this is a good mm -hmm. band. I played mm -hmm. in this, we traveled quite a bit. And mm -hmm. What kind of music did you do? Kind of covers and original, originals mm -hmm. and covers, mm -hmm. stuff for like the lounge kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, it was kind of silly lounge things. Yeah. It was fun. Great. It was very fun. Great. I like that group. Oh, now this. This is, uh, this is the uh, village people. No, this is, uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is me with a big mustache, uh, with a, there, yeah. a country band called Alias. Uh -huh. we were playing. This is around the time when uh, urban country was big with sure. uh, John Travolta and Again. bucking Broncos in a bar. The wardrobe. It was a great thing. You we guys were, are great. We were a hot country playing <laughs> Eagles, you know. Sure. The Eagles sure. are hip again. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. And then uh, this is, this is we opened up, uh, we were either playing, this is either the Wee Fest or we were playing in, uh, mm -hmm. in Mary Dana, who's a, mm -hmm. Mary Dana is a uh, singer, singer songwriter and she's in Nashville right now. She's mm -hmm. got a top 10 co-written a top 10 country hit right now. So mm -hmm. Mary was great. We had a lot of fun working yeah, together. Yeah, we worked great. well. And I so we've learned a little bit about your musical past. Um, as you were in the thick of being a musician and doing all the gigs and traveling, did you ever think that you'd end up doing what you're doing now, writing uh, music and doing sound design Absolutely for commercials? Absolutely not. Not at all. No way. I just yeah. expected it all to be. I expected to play music. I didn't, and I took a diversion. I went to I went to Brown Institute for a mm -hmm. while, yep. which is a funny story because I could barely get in, <laughs> thinking it was such a cake uh, thing to get into. Yeah. I failed twice and I couldn't go for a year. So oh. when I finally got through yeah. it. I took electronics and figured mm -hmm. out how to do how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. It helped a lot for yeah. music things. Uh, it helped to know how a studio works because then I became a recording engineer. Mm -hmm. Worked at KTCA for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, became audio director after uh, about a year and a half mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Still playing music. Still playing music, mm -hmm. but always playing, you know, playing for myself, writing with friends, mm -hmm. playing duos, right. you know, playing in coffee shops and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But then it got to the point where I just I wanted to. Do, a couple of guys that I worked with said, "Let's do music for commercials." So we got a, a PSA. Mm -hmm. Had it turned out really well. A little pro bono work. Pro bono is always mm -hmm. where you start. Yeah, yeah. Went from that to uh, getting a, a decent, like a McDonald's ad. Mm -hmm. uh, came out of local here, out of Carmichael Lynch, was mm -hmm. doing McDonald's mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. And we just, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we decided to blend it all together and yeah. put our money into something we wanted. Mm -hmm. Worked. When you, not everybody that does, you know, you came, you came from that musician or the, the doing the full time music gig to, to doing a business, and there's a, there's a big difference between the two. I mean, you had to, not yeah. everybody who wants to start up a shop like yours is going to be successful. True. Obviously, a lot of people will bring some musical talent and lots of musical right. talent to what you do, but you must have had something extra or something special that allowed you to succeed in the business. I must have a business sense of some mm -hmm. sort. Uh, I think know. that's it, yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, I, I've done, you know, I've worked in restaurants, I've worked in service industry, mm -hmm. been a bartender, you know, worked yeah. in, uh, used to set up water beds, but we won't get into that. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a good, you know, a lot of taste of business, mm -hmm. and I suppose you. Oh, sure. I suppose if uh, it's a natural thing, it worked out for me. Mm -hmm. You know, you borrow a bunch of money, and somehow you, you know, I had, a, I had somebody write me a business, work with me to write a business plan. Mm -hmm. I actually had to write it. Yep. Which is the hardest thing I think anyone could do in life. I think mm -hmm. it's harder than buying a house. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> and it's scary. Yeah. And it and it, worked, it worked, and worked, and I got I got loans, and I got a life out of it. Mm -hmm. It's really been great for me. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed it. Tell me what kinds of trends you are seeing right now in music and sound design for commercials? Trends. What's, what's hot, man? Boy, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. What is hot? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a hard one. I don't know where yeah. I'm going to go with that. You know, I just, I, I, I don't watch, I, I see, you see a lot of pop tunes, like they're going back to using, uh, you know, old hits, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of the old oh, 60s yeah. hits and things like mm -hmm. that. That stuff is popular. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's very true. Retro, retro is hip right now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when something's a fad, you mm -hmm. see a lot of that in sound design and, yeah. and music, like, you know, the whole pop-up videos thing was yeah. big. Well, now you see pop-up everything. Yeah, it's everywhere. Um, it's just imitation. Everything's mm -hmm. a, everybody's mm -hmm. imitating everything else that's been successful. Mm -hmm. You know, the Volkswagen commercial with the, 
da da da, you know, that, oh, yeah, that with the yeah. chair and all that. People have taken that and mm -hmm. give me an ad like that, and so yeah. you, we'll get calls for somebody from somebody who wants us to do something mm -hmm. similar to that. Mm -hmm. And there's a Volkswagen spot on the air, air right now. That, I think they're in New Orleans, and, the, and there's the windshield wiper. It goes to the wipers. I think that's pretty cool. It's a wonderful cool. way to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, now most, that's the music. That's, that's you know that's carrying that spot. That's where most of the good song, most of the songs when I do songwriting for mm -hmm. for myself and stuff that I try to sell. Mm -hmm. Most of the good songs come from either walking or wipers or yeah. some click that's happening. Something mm -hmm. like it gives you a beat and a thought and a mm -hmm. then you go with it. It's mm -hmm. just it's very fun. What's the process? So uh, an agency has a spot. They want to do something. They come to you with an idea. You set a storyboard. Mm -hmm. Do they say, well, I w I want it to sound like you know, this or what, that's what, helpful. Typically, what's the process? Typically, they come to you and they say, "We're doing a commercial. It's going to be for uh, it's going to be for Miller Lite, and mm -hmm. it, uh, we want something, and we want something that's kind of like fast-paced porn music, it's like <laughs> porn music." <laughs> Hello. So you go out and buy a bunch of porn records, you know, <laughs> and you listen to this music, uh -huh. and you think, "Hmm, how's that going to work?" And then uh -huh. they tell you, "We're thinking of this style." <laughs> yeah. And it, and so you, you, they give you a board, they give you what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. You think about what's going to what you might do, mm -hmm. they send you a rough cut of it after mm -hmm. they've shot it, and then you try to paste the music to it. You right. find a beat that seems to work with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. We we come up with what we think is an idea, mm -hmm. and then they say, they'll say, well, that was close, or yeah. how about we're thinking more like this, or mm -hmm. they'll tell you what mm -hmm. what they're thinking, what kind of beat, or what mm -hmm. kind of instrumentation. So they, they'll give you a general little blurb of what they're yeah. what they're aiming for, and then you just take it and run with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you'll land in the same spot. Yeah. So. Normally, do you usually hit when they when they're coming in with their rough cut and you're putting music behind it, and then they come back and I'd watch? I'd say ninety-five percent of the time. You're hitting. And I don't know if I I'm happy to say if, I think probably everyone does. I don't mm -hmm. think I'm I don't yeah. think I'm unique in that. But you miss only when you don't hear them. If you don't pay attention to what they're actually asking for, you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can miss. But they mm -hmm. they keep uh, they, you know they're on you. They they keep mm -hmm. with you. They don't let you just fail. They don't because because it's yeah. important. They're spending a lot of money for oh, this. Yeah. Yep. The money if you don't. If you don't hit, you're, uh, mm -hmm. you're wasting their time, mm -hmm. client's time. Don't want to do that. No, we don't want to do that. <laughs> get your, your hands spanked. Yeah. Um, do you still use real musicians playing real instruments for your stuff? We almost always will use real musicians for everything. Mm -hmm. um, real instruments, real players, it adds just a real life and a flavor that mm -hmm. just can't be beat. You know, there's mm -hmm. so much nuance within the instrument. And the player, certain players, you know, mm -hmm. well, gu guitar's a guitar, yep. but each player brings something different to it. Mm -hmm. And we will always mock it up with synthesizers right. and then try, hopefully, to get them, so, you know, a lot of times they'll say, this sounds good enough, and we'll yeah. beg to put something real in there and say, no, it's just, it's fine. we're fine. Yeah. But almost all the time, we'll replace it with real, real players. You have to. Yeah. I agree. It's very important. I'm glad. I'm actually glad to hear it. Very it kind of surprises me because, you know, I'm thinking people are using all the equipment and not the, you know, we have that makes the sound, yeah. but not the real people doing the real. We've thing. got so many great players in this oh, town too. Mm -hmm. We just such a plethora of wonderful play, people to work with. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, I think before we go, I one last kind of that traditional last question. Just because I know that there, are, I have a stepson who's in the music business and there are probably a lot of people out <laughs> there who play music. If you have some advice for them, um, if they were interested maybe in learning more about this as a career or doing this, what, what would your advice be for those folks? I'd say, I'd say getting involved in any kind of um, music School, music schools are good nowadays. Mm -hmm. It gives you a chance to, to network with a bunch of the players. I know that we locally have a music school here. Um, music Tech. Music Tech that's, mm -hmm. that's doing, you know, I think it's a pretty decent idea. Mm -hmm. I haven't gone and explored it yet, but I know a lot of great people who work there. Mm -hmm. um, learning through that, going to a recording engineering school is a good thing. Because mm -hmm. you, need, you need to have some of the tools to be able to put your music down and mm -hmm. understand how to get it there. I mean, you, mm -hmm. could, you could just be a creative savant and come in with your you know your guitar and say I write music for commercials, but then mm -hmm. you got to you got to do a business part of it. Yep. So you need some business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need some smarts, and I think you can get that by learning service industry things. Mm -hmm. School is great. Mm -hmm. I never say anything bad about you know going to college. Yeah. If you can do it all at once, good. The more you can take in, mm -hmm. the more you can bring back to the party. Mm -hmm. Well, now that we've talked for this amount of time, I want to um, show some people your work. Oh, And it's great goodness. stuff. I have to say, I was really impressed. Thank you. And you've got some great clients and um, national level stuff. And boy, it's, it's good. Um, so we're going to see a whole reel. This is your this demo is reel demo that you reel. use. The reel that gets me work. The reel that gets you Currently. work. Currently. Yep.
Why don't you set it up just a little bit for us? We're going to see some uh, about eight spots, I think. I think there's uh, maybe about maybe about six. six. Yep, I think you're right. I haven't. I don't remember the exact order, mm -hmm. but I think that the, there's a uh, there's a spot, a Miller Light spot, mm -hmm. which is all about these blindfolds they were giving out yeah. over the summer, which you wet them down, and it's kind of a parody about the whole mm -hmm. idea that the blindfolds didn't work, and so there's a lot of fun in that. Yep. There's a uh, the Strand, you got a couple there's Strand. A st there's a Cleo winning spot in there mm -hmm. called the Strand Ferry, and that was mm -hmm. a spot with this ferry that comes out and is being supported by fishing line. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a spot, I can't remember the third one because I don't have the order in front of me, but That's I know okay. there's a spot in there about, uh, uh, there's a spot about the, for the Minnesota Lottery, which is a oh, kind yeah. of a uh, orchestrated, mm -hmm. the very orchestrated uh, cartoon. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a spot in there also about um, uh, for uh, fetal alcohol syndrome kids, oh. which was kind of a <gasps> that's right a nice I, spot. Mm, that's the last one on the reel. I that's think that's the last one on the reel. It's a really nice spot. That was kind of a movie spot. We oh boy, yeah, it was fun to put just basic guitars and uh, mm -hmm. guitars, organ and keyboard together. Yeah, it was, it was a, very moving. Yes, it's a it's a very powerful spot. Yeah, thanks. And I'm going to ask our viewers to really it, to listen. listen to what you did underneath and the support that you provide to the visuals. That's, it's just great stuff. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of work underneath the commercials. Yeah. 30 seconds is a, you have to put a lot, a lot of sound and a lot of, a lot of thought into 30 seconds. And mm -hmm. just, it's fun. It's the deal. It's a deal. Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Jan. And now, your spots. Last year, we introduced the Miller Lite Blindfold, a remarkable product that contained crystals which, when soaked in water, would keep the wearer completely cool and completely in the dark. Of the three million we made, we sold two. This year, we've applied that same cooling technology to an even more amazing product, the Miller Lite Headband. Look for it somewhere. little children. I will help. Should have used Stren. Stren, the most dependable fishing line in the world. Bargain hunting is kind of my hobby. It's her life. Okay, it's my life. I need a good bargain. So the last thing I'm going to pay for is a checking account. Look at this jacket. Where are you going to wear that? <laughs> Gotta have a glove. So if I write a check, and I'm getting charged for checking, then it's not a bargain anymore. Now you can open your free checking account by phone. Just call 1-800-368-6835 today. For my money, it's commerce. Minnesota State Lottery is just what you're looking for. It's hibernation hoopla. Match three of a kind to win up to $5,000. So play hibernation hoopla. And don't take winter. Lying down. You are watching a radio commercial. Please be quiet. Dick knows you can't show naked people on TV, but by merely saying the words naked people in a radio commercial, you force listeners to picture naked people. Here's what Dick wants you to picture in your mind while listening to his commercial. Naked people, naked thirsty people, opening Miller Lights, wearing nothing except cowboy boots with spurs, drinking Miller Lite, naked. Cut. Beautiful work, Doctor.
should have used Stren. Stren, the most dependable fishing line in the world. My mom was drinking while she was pregnant. I don't know what it's like to be a normal kid. There's a lot of kids like me. I, I was born with the Oculus term syndrome. Your brain doesn't work very right. It thinks differently than other people's. It gives you brain damage. Nothing goes right. When I get upset, I hit people. My mom drunk while she was pregnant with me. I didn't do anything wrong. I don't have to be born in this room. I suck my thumb. I get in trouble. In Sometimes I do bad things without knowing why. I don't know what it's like to be a normal kid because I've never been a normal kid. I won't be like this forever. I hope. My name is Ruth Ann, and I have fetal alcohol syndrome. And that was a reel of work by Johnny Hagen of Absolute Music. Good stuff. I thought so, too, indeed. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for Arts News with me, Phil Lindsay. And me, Janet Zahn. Don't they usually have an announcer for that? Yeah, if they've got a budget. Now, for our first story, the Jungle Theater opens its permanent new site this month at 2951 Lindale Avenue South. That's in Minneapolis's Whittier neighborhood. Opened originally around the corner on Lake Street in 1991, the Jungle inaugurates its home with that Scottish play by William Shakespeare. Opening night is February 12th. Minnesota's commercial production industry continues its legislative efforts this month to alleviate the 6.5% sales tax on the creative services that go into the making of television commercials. Their bill has garnered bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. Now, Mark Bauma's fresco work at the University of St. Thomas in downtown Minneapolis is the topic of a documentary that KTCA Channel 2 will screen on April 1st. It's produced by Artemis Productions in Connecticut with uh, Association of Intermedia Arts here in Minneapolis. It includes a significant educational and outreach effort as part of the program package. Now, regular Artifacts viewers may recall our interview and behind-the-scenes tour with the artist, Mark Bauma, in the summer of 93. Let's take a look. It's not the Sistine Chapel. However, the fresco technique being used here is the same technique Michelangelo used to do the Sistine Chapel. Where is here? Here is the ceiling of the lobby of the College of St. Thomas in downtown Minneapolis. The 1999 Minnesota Production Guide was released at the end of January. This guide is the most complete resource to film and video professionals, related companies, and services in the state. This year's production guide also features beautiful outdoor mural photographs by Moira Harris, provided by Pogo Press, a small press in St. Paul that concentrates on the regional perspective. And the Northern Clay Center announces the American Pottery Festival. That's scheduled for April 23rd through the 25th. Scheduled are 21 potters, dialogue demonstrations, slide talks, and no less than 1,500 pots. Northern Clay is on Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis's Seward neighborhood near the Mississippi River. And that's the Artifacts News for February 1999. Next up, Phil welcomes the editor of the Minnesota Literature Newsletter, Mary Smith, right after this from one of the exhibitions at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Now they do that exhibition, I believe, annually over at the College of Art and Design, and from what you just saw, there are some very strong uh, images in there, so I recommend it. If you can, get over there and see that uh, youth arts exhibition. With me now is um, 
a woman who's the editor of a uh, newsletter. It's Minnesota Literature. And she's really going to kind of kick off a discussion here uh, with our next few guests about newsletters that cover various arts disciplines here in Minnesota. Mary Smith, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And I was just telling Mary as we were getting ready here that uh, many years ago I subscribed to this newsletter as it's probably getting going, and now I'm back on the rolls mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. But tell our viewers, this has a venerable history. How long has Minnesota literature been up and around? Actually, it started with a very um, statewide committee meeting at the what was called the Minnesota State Arts Council. This is this predates, predates the, State the Arts, Arts Board. Board. Interesting. And um, someone there pulled together um, people like Mark Vins from Moorhead, um, Bill Meissner from St. Cloud, Nathaniel Hart from Morris, um, Michael Dennis Brown from the University, and said, "What do we need for literature?" And they came up with this idea that um, we needed a, we needed a communications mechanism, a newsletter of a sort, and five hundred dollars for grants. Oh, there to was, encourage mm -hmm, there the participation. Were, there was no Bush funding, no McKnight funding, no Jerome funding. Um, the loft wasn't in existence, and they thought five hundred dollars would be a nice amount to grant people. Which one you're starting writers. with? Mm -hmm. Nothing. That's a great That's bump right, right there. Mm -hmm. That's great. So this. Um, has a venerable history. I would say. Now, this puts it back into what, about the mid-70s? About 73. Mm -hmm. Right. And as I think you were telling me, um, although you're actually in your 25th right. year, mm -hmm. by number, you're in your 24th volume, volume. of this. Mm -hmm. Describe briefly what one would see if one uh, was to look in the Minnesota literature. I know uh, in the last few issues that I've seen, um, you have, a, I guess, an opinion piece. Is that typical that you'd start out with that? Um, not always, but we encourage people to write opinions about what's happening in literature and literary events and uh, we always like opinions that are going to be that are going to generate discussion that's our our main purpose because we like to get a dialogue going between writers and then we uh, um, cover everything from events a calendar of events um, opportunities that can include grants right. workshops conferences um, writing markets uh, classes Right, and that's got to be just gold for your readers because they're trying to make a living or they're interested in pursuing their writing careers. Mm -hmm. um, who, who does read it? I, I'm assuming sort of the Minnesota literary community is well aware of it and subscribes. Do you get general readership or how, who pays attention to the literature in Minnesota? Um, probably people who have an interest in language and wordsmithing and writing. It may not be um, literary writing, it just may be personal journal writing, or mm -hmm. that which can be literary, of course, but um, I'd say people who really have sort of um, looked at writing or see writing as a, as a personal interest. Okay, so it's a way to stay abreast of what's going on in the mm -hmm. field. What's your background? How did you get into editing this <laughs> thing? And it's been a while for you as well, hasn't it? Fifteen years. Fifteen years. Mm -hmm. Did you think it would last that long? Never ever. No. <laughs> Never ever. Um, we're not even sure the newsletter will last that long. <laughs> uh, it, it's a service, it's not an institution, so we, we yeah. survive as long as we perform a service. Yeah. And, and you must be, I mean, if it's lasted this long. I think so. Yeah. Um, so how did, you got a phone call and somebody said, so-and-so's no. leaving and we need an editor, or had you already been involved? No, I, I was a subscriber. The State Arts Board published it originally, and it was um, free, so anyone could call and sign up okay. and receive it. That's probably how I was on the list back then. I said, it's a free deal, <laughs> I'll get that. Exactly. <laughs> My motivation, too. That's right. And then, um, I think about the, in the 80s, or even late 70s, funding was cut back. Services were not funded. Um, the decision was made to fund artists directly. And because we were the only newsletter the Arts Board was doing, they weren't doing one for dance, one for theater, the visual arts. They said, well, this is a place we can cut. And they needed to cut at that time. So then we, um, actually the people who were on the Articles of Incorporation are Dan Odegaard, Sue Ann Martinson, and Deborah Keenan. And they and some other people said, let's get this, let's form a corporation and get this going um, on a subscriber basis, have people pay. Then of course, subscriptions plummeted. Right, well, and because you mm -hmm. made that transition yeah. out of the mm -hmm. sort of the mailing lists and everything the Arts Board probably had behind mm -hmm. that. Well, at least a couple of those names are familiar. Odegaard, I assume, oh. is the bookstore. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah Keenan, a mm -hmm. fairly well-known mm -hmm. uh, poet is, yes. is her mm -hmm. genre. And teacher. And, and teacher, university. Mm -hmm. Minnesota. Various places. Various places, that's right. Well, it sounds like a great history. Mm -hmm. um, it, from your vantage point, both as the editor, because information comes to you, uh, and as somebody who's worked in the field over these years, 
what have you seen? What changes? What trends are going on? I mean, since those early days in the 70s where people said, here's what we really need now to help nurture literature. Has there been a change? Are there new things that are uh, challenges for writers in Minnesota? Well, probably the support originally came from our academic institutions. That's why Bill Meisner, when I mentioned him, he's St. Cloud, uh, Nathaniel um, Hart is from Morris, University of Minnesota, Morris, Michael Dennis Brown, Minnesota, Mike, Mark Vins, Moorhead. Right. Um, and those institutions are still very basic to the literary scene. But then on top of that, the, the loft came in. Yes, of course, they've been providing great service for. Oh, uh, they're a major player on the national that's literary right. stage. That's right. Are there major. other um, newsletters like this anywhere else in the United States? I mean, is there a Iowa literature newsletter or anything? No, that, and that's kind of interesting because I keep getting requests from all over the country saying, you have this wonderful thing going, how do we do it here? And in fact, the Illinois State Arts Board tried to um, fund it in Illinois and couldn't get it off the ground. It doesn't seem like it would be that complicated, really, if you had just a, a, a minimum of support and then the, the great interest on the part of the local yeah. writers. I, I think probably it's because ours is so organic. It just grew with the writing arts. Right. And, and to take a community that already exists and then tr transplant or supplant, supplant a newsletter on it doesn't work as well. Well, that's true. Grafting it on mm -hmm. probably isn't mm -hmm. the same thing as, let it, as you said, let it grow organically. Um, you're always interested, as I understand it, in having people submit to you items for your, your news column or your, uh, your calendar of events. Uh, why don't we take a moment right now and just let people know if they what Can they call or how would they get in touch with? Yes, they can call or they can write or email. Oh, you've got all those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, right after our interview here, we're going to bring up on our screen uh, both an image of the newsletter and also let people know how they can get in touch. Uh, with you folks, either okay. either to subscribe, which I think is just a great window on, on the literary scene, or from your point of view, uh, to maybe submit some, some mm -hmm. items. Well, Mary, I want to thank you very much for coming on and giving us sort of the overview of Minnesota literature. Well, it's thank been you. great to learn more about it. Thank you very much. So do stay tuned because we're going to give you that quick image now of the uh, Minnesota Literature Newsletter and let you know how you can get in touch with what Mary Smith and her folks are doing there. So stay tuned. You're watching Artifacts. We'll be right back. Well, what you just saw was a way you can get in touch with the folks over at Minnesota Literature. And what we'll do with, uh, actually, all of the newsletters that we're talking about on this month's edition of Artifacts is at the end of our show, we'll have some information so that you can get in touch with them and subscribe, send info to them, or whatever. My next two guests uh, also edit uh, and are in charge of some newsletters that uh, pertain to their particular arts disciplines. John Scollin, Mac Facts, and we'll explain what Mac Facts is all about. And Nancy Mason-Hauser, thank you How for being you? here. Minnesota Dance. Now. I, uh, as with Minnesota Literature, I make sure to get your newsletters uh, at my desk. And I must say, I'm one of those folks that reads them virtually cover to cover. They're full of news. They're very interesting. But for the sake of our viewers that know nothing about them, let's explain first, John, what MACT FACT means. I'm using an acronym here, but that's the name of your newsletter. OK. MACT is the Minnesota Association of Community Theaters. And MACT FACTS is the newsletter that we've had for about 25 years. Now, that I didn't know, 25 years. Yeah. That's also venerable. Yeah, we started uh, basically doing play festivals in 1973, and then have since expanded to do workshops and conferences. And the main item is the newsletter, to try to keep people aware of what's happening uh, throughout the state. And I must say, you do a very good job on that. You have inside that, I think, the, the best uh, compendium of uh, what's going on in theater in the state, um, bar none. I mean, none of the daily papers, the weeklies, or anybody even comes close. So I'm just giving you a shameless plug here. I'm not involved with Mac. If you want to find out what's going on in theater anywhere in the state, Mac Facts is it. How do you get that information? There's a ton of it there. Well, my postman brings me lots of mail every yeah. day, as he does to your place, too. Uh, we ask theaters to send us their schedules every year. Uh, we, f we read other newsletters, all the regional arts councils newsletters. We read the, the daily papers, of course. Right. Well, and and I just steal everything. I look through the audition columns to see if there's a new theater starting, and there pra practically is every week. Right. And so now you're getting into the area, though, that I know is your work for both of you. Yeah. You do edit it. I mean, you're yes. looking for stuff. It isn't just a passive reception. And Nancy, over in your field, too, um, how do you operate? How do you get all that chock full of information that you put into your newsletter? Well, as John was saying, a lot comes from the releases that come and any other articles or 
um, reading programs from other, um, mm -hmm. sometimes other disciplines, you know, that have a listing of what other dance things might be happening in the spaces as well. Right, and um, your newsletter is also, is, am I right in this, it's an arm of or part of uh, Minnesota Dance Alliance? Right, and we're celebrating our 20th year, so we're the younger sister of you. Oh, congratulations. And, uh, the idea of the Dance Alliance is that it's a service organization for dance companies and choreographers throughout the state. And um, it has everything from information, if you're looking for theaters to book, or lighting designers, or where to find dancers, all that kind of thing, as well as answering questions um, about the dance field, as well as setting up opportunities for dance companies to perform. Um, and for, as well as the newsletter. And for me, one of the most enlightening things in there is, and indeed, you have regularly uh, space available. I, I forget you have the column heading for that. Right, Marketplace. Marketplace. And that's a great resource for folks that are saying, you know, I need a place to rehearse. I'm, I need to block out a show. I want to put on a show. And I don't think people often have that resource otherwise, right. except right. for what you do. That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about who the readers are, or who your audience is. John, um, Obviously, folks that are involved in community theater probably subscribe in, in droves. Do you get some general readership? I mean, who pays attention to MACT facts? Well, there are probably uh, 350 or so theater organizations in Minnesota, and about half of them are community theaters. So we have our membership is both theaters and individuals. So we have all of the theater organizations, and we have uh, a couple of thousand individuals that uh, like theater either because they're a performer, they're a tech person, they're an audience member, they just like to know what their community is doing and what other communities are doing. So right. we get a, it's a, it's a broad readership. So it's kind of both. Some people have a foot very much in the field and other folks are yeah. more sort of general public enjoy theater. Mm -hmm. Any sense of who, obviously the professionals in the field care about what's going on in the field and that's a great way to learn about what someone else is doing. Any sense of who your readers are? Well, it's very curious. It's pretty much as John was saying, but it's always amazing to me because we have a fair amount of readers from outside the state too. Outside of Minnesota? Um, yeah. Oh. I mean New York and California and Washington DC and sometimes um, those are other presenting organizations that want to know more about dance that's happening in Minnesota, um, maybe with the idea of bringing it into their particular um, community. Oh, yeah, so there, it's a window on who's doing what back in Minnesota. Exactly. Maybe let's get them out for a residency or a performance right. in Ohio or whatever. Right. Oh, that's, oh, that's another great service then for your, your members, I guess, right. as it were. Is it difficult, I'll just ask it straight up, is it difficult to pay attention to what's going on in greater Minnesota? I think a lot of folks, not those here today necessarily, but a lot of folks tend to think, oh, it's what's going on in the Twin Cities. But we all know that Duluth is active and many other t cities and towns around the state. How do you pay attention to what's going on out there? How are you hooked in? Well, that's a very good question, and that is something that the Dance Alliance is constantly struggling with, is the outreach throughout greater Minnesota. And um, I was actually talking to, to my husband last night about it. I said, I wonder how people do it. And part of it is having um, correspondence in different parts of um, the state who will send in information. Because there is a lot that's happening out there, but unless it's... Um, you know, the, there's one person up in Duluth named Doris Russell who is very good about sending down information about what she's doing and what's happening up there. So she's like but a springer there, up there. Yeah, she's paying but it, attention. But it really is, I, I would be most interested with John because in his publication you really do have a, a wonderful sense of what's happening around the state. Well, I'm from greater Minnesota, so I lived in southern and western. So when I first got into theater, it was we're going we're gonna to be the same as the big guys in the cities, and we're not going to take any backseat to anybody. And so, uh, yes, we have board members from Greater Minnesota. We have meetings in Minnesota. We hold play receptions throughout the state. We have our festivals largely in Greater Minnesota because rental situations here are, are tougher. Uh, so we, we, we get people involved that way. And we, and we call people all the time. Now, as laudable as that is, do you find that that also then becomes sort of an organizing opportunity for folks oh, around yes. the state? Yes. I mean, people will, they may be in southern Minnesota, but you're having something up in northern, they will go there. That's not a barrier yeah. for them to cross the state and do that. And I'm surprised at how many uh, really professional artists have moved from the cities just for their own peace of mind to uh. a, a tiny little town. And they may go all over the country as a consultant and, of course, using our newsletter to see where opportunities are uh, is also mm -hmm. helpful to them. Well, one of the things I've liked about both of your newsletters is that in addition to some of the nuts and bolts, the, the really helpful kind of resources that are in there, you get a sense uh, of some of the issues and the trends 
that are going on. I know in the most recent issue of the Minnesota Dance, wonderful uh, story um, in an interview with Sam Costa, which was a, a touching piece and an important piece to do, I thought. Um, and I know that sometimes some of the issues that are uh, present for the theater community, I can read about them maybe first in your newsletter. Uh, and I just wanted to open it up in the 20 or 25 years that you're um, work has gone on, and I'm assuming that neither of you necessarily personally go back 25 or so years. Why, we're barely 25 years that's old right. I mean, right? Born in a leap year, you're still here. Um, what are some of the issues and trends in dance that you're seeing from where you sit, which is a kind of a neat place to look at dance here in the Minnesota area? Well, one of the most exciting things is the idea of um, different kinds of dance working together um, to reach a greater audience. One thing, as you mentioned, Sam Costa is, is quite amazing. He has uh, come up with this incredible concept called Around the Block, and he started this about two years ago. His company is a modern dance company. He brought in um, a hip-hop company, a uh, flamenco company, a, a Hmong dance company, a ballet company. Each company has um, a part of the program, and it's a chance for an audience to come and be exposed to many different kinds of art forms. And what his company has done is kind of um, takes aspects of some of the different uh, companies so they're the glue between. That's one thing. The Martin Luther King legacy that just happened last weekend once again brought in a lot of different dance companies to do a piece or two pieces, um, once again broadening uh, the possible so audience. Some cross pollination, as it exactly. were. Exactly. Bringing m multiple. John, how about in your field? Are there. Uh, I know some years back, I mean, the big thing because of cost was, well, we're going to be doing one and two person shows. I mean, that was a necessary evil, I guess, for a lot of companies. Are you seeing any other trends that are uh, confronting, um, whether it's community theater, professional theater, or, or what have you? Uh, in uh, perhaps all realms, the, just the, the direction towards more technical theater and fancier things you can do with lighting and how the, the cost of computer boards is coming down and equipment is is going into new places. So just the, the how you can involve technical fun stuff because theaters are competing with TV and film, so they have to compete and grab attention that way. The one and two person shows probably are the, uh, theaters would like to do them because of the challenge they give to their artists and because they're good plays generally. Mm -hmm. And we, we try to promote that, but they're not big attention uh, getters. Uh, and we also try to promote new plays because through the Playwright Center and other places we have a lot of good playwrights in Minnesota and I think we've seen some of those new plays particularly at our festivals. This year's festival we have five new plays that are being done out of 14 and it's, I mean that's exciting. Five original? Original plays, plays oh, from Minnesota and uh, so, so if we see other, other, other theaters get a chance to see these and they say my goodness this is good and maybe we should try this in our hometown right. and uh, so that gives a real bump then to the playwright. Yeah, get great exposure. My guess is, and this may just be a stereotype, my, that a lot of what goes on in the dance community is original, though. I mean, or, or am I wrong? Are there are there a lot of sort of retrospectives of? I know John Munger recently did a uh, kind of retrospective of some of his works. So it's not unheard of, but my sense is that most of the dance I go out and see is pretty new. Right. Unlike you know Euripides or something yeah, in, in the play world or something. Yeah. That's true, and that's, I think that's, that's just the nature of the beast. Is it hard to recreate a dance from 10 years ago? Or? Well, for a lot of artists, it's not as interesting to revisit it as okay. they're still um, creating new things. Yeah. And uh, a fair amount of the community, I think, are um, artists, even though they may be more mature as performers because they've performed with other people, um, are not that uh, experienced with doing choreography, so mm -hmm. they still have a lot that they want to get out. Yeah, they have more to say. Yeah. Sure. Um, I know just a little bit about your background. Um, let's talk about it briefly. Um, you had an early youthful interest in dance, right? I always wanted to be a ballerina Yeah. since age five. Um, I trained that way. I went to National Ballet School when I was 12 wow. and lived up in Toronto for a number of years. Uh, then I came to my senses, fortunately, <laughs> in my early 20s, and I became a dance critic in New York for Dance Magazine. Yeah. And after five years, I realized I loved dance too much to be a critic, and so I went to WGBH TV in uh, Boston, public television, okay. and started working with video and with dancers. And that's actually the other hat that I wear besides being the editor for the newsletter is videotaping um, dance companies here. So you get to live your life in the world you care about. Yeah. That sounds good. Really and your background, I know you mentioned south, southwestern Minnesota. 
Um, theater background? I don't know this about you. No theater background whatsoever. No. <laughs> Just an Al Although avid... I got into it because in my very first play I got a chance to, to kiss the prettiest girl in the class, so I've been in theater ever, <laughs> ever since. I Some kind of inducement. Into, I wanted to be a, a grocery store owner ah. because of all the chocolate, you know, that one could, oh, okay. <laughs> could okay. have at one's disposal. So, so now instead of putting chocolate bars on, on shelves, I put theater schedules together. That sounds good. How often does Mac Fact come, Mac Facts come out? We're bi-monthly. Bi-monthly. And Minnesota Dance? Insane. Now that's just a coincidence. I, didn't, I guess I should have known that because I, get, I subscribe. Well, that's good. I want to thank you both for being here. Um, as we've mentioned, um, if you want to find out more about either of these newsletters, um, we'll run something up on the screen in just a moment. Nancy, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having Keep up the good work, John. Good to see you. So take a look at this. Find out more about uh, what these two newsletters are about. And uh, we'll be back right after this. about confronting spiritual life in the smallest possible ways. He does and says, love being one. <coughs> I would be master of the small, and my reactions with and actions with other people, I would be the embodiment of the perfect tiny gesture, the essence or aura of a man is the sum of the small things he does and says. Instead of the missed gesture, the overlooked birthday, the forgotten appointment, the tiny attempts to reach out that somehow feel awkward or faintly embarrassing, as though I'm speaking of love in a left-handed way to a right-handed world. I would say the word, touch the shoulder, accept the praise, ease the way, help, matter, love. Where my writing contends with stuffy and distant and large, oh so large, it would be master of the sentence, of the diction that delights with tiny surprise and small day-to-day -day knowing, recognizing ourselves in others and others in ourselves so tiny bit by fractional bit, perfect word by phrase by sentence, the little writing comes to the little devastation of being. Where all living seems huge, I would be master of reducing it to the tiniest number, the number out of which all order, all ordinals derive, all gestures derive, all words derive. I would be the master of one. Well, and that was just one of uh, Mark Christensen's poems from a reading he gave uh, at that uh, Minnesota Writers event last year. It's nice so. stuff and yeah. a nice show. I enjoyed it. Hey, Hope you, know, you learned something. Phil, I didn't want to let all the newsletter talk go mm -hmm. without having uh, mentioning some of the film and video newsletters that are out there. Lots of good ones. For corporate film and video makers, um, ITVA CitySync, great resource. That's right. For independent film and video makers. I'll do the Carol Merrill thing right Yeah, here. IFP so. North does a great newsletter. I think it's published bi-monthly. And that is Independent Feature, Feature Project. Project North. That's right. Screenwriters Workshop also has a newsletter. I don't have a sample here for you. Minnesota AICP, the commercial producers do a newsletter periodically, but quarterly. I edit that so it's every time I can get it done. And, of course, resources and counseling for the arts. Chock full of good information Absolutely. here. I, actually, it's a very complex and uh, sort of well-developed industry that mm -hmm. you work in. So Indeed. that's good. And there are more. Yes. None. I'm holding here the <laughs> Twin Cities Jazz Notes, which has an excellent calendar of mm -hmm. jazz events going on in the Twin Cities. So if uh, you're interested in any of these that we're showing you now, you know, you can call our hotline and we'll connect you to those folks. 673-2234. Mm -hmm. I bet you, you well, you're familiar yep. here mm -hmm. with the uh, Minnesota 
Minnesota Music Academy. They've got a great uh, newsletter here, serves the mm -hmm. industry, and mm -hmm. again, the general public might find that of interest. You may know, if you're a blues fan, that the Twin Cities Blues News is out uh, at newsstands. And now this one, I bet I you didn't this. know. Do you know this one? No. Nope. Minnesota Percussion News. See? If you listen carefully, you can hear the drum beat. <laughs> so they're all out everyone. there. <laughs> and unrelated to newsletters, um, there's going to be a, a talk given uh, later in the month, Using Plants to Build Community. That's the topic of a talk to be given February 27th out at the Hennepin Technical College in Brooklyn Park. Bonnie McDonald and Jack uh, Parker from the Minneapolis uh, Committee on Urban Environment are the speakers. A nice way to start Start thinking about the warm oh, weather. I'm already thinking about it. Oh, yeah. okay, it's my turn. Yes. Um, AICP is doing a very important seminar. The uh, coordinators workshop is happening on February 27th and 28th. It's a two-day or a day and a half uh, workshop at the Minneapolis Hilton. If you're interested in this part of the business, being a commercial uh, uh, coordinator. Call the hotline. Great resource. We'll tell you more. Absolutely. And for those of you who've been watching in Minneapolis, our first artifact special, we did an hour-long special uh, this winter on cultural facilities. You can also now get a chance to see it on the Metro Cable Network. That's Channel 6, Metro-wide. And it's an hour-long discussion mm -hmm. about uh, some of the issues that are behind some of the cultural facility development here in mm -hmm. Minneapolis. Good. So, yeah. Coming up next, our artifacts calendar. And Watch, get out your pencils and pens. That's right. Write down the events. It's great. So if you did see anything you want to find out more about here on Artifacts, call our hotline. That's 673-2234. We'll see you next time. I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janice Zahn. Thanks for watching. Want to know who's who and what's what in the Minnesota film and video production business? This month's Artifacts giveaway is the Minnesota Production Guide, published by the Minnesota Film Board. It is your clearinghouse to film and video production personnel, equipment, and services from animal wranglers and special effects to producers and payroll services. Fill all your production needs with the Minnesota Production Guide. And this $30 value could be yours if you're the seventh caller to leave your name and phone number on the City Cable 34 hotline. 673-2234. Be sure to tell us you're watching Artifacts 2. That number again, 673-2234.